My name is Josh Miller. I own Riverstone Kennels, and I've been training gun dogs for more than 16 years. I have field trialed, I've hunt tested, but at the end of the day, I'm a duck hunter. You might find that the duck in our Duck Dogs podcast is spelt uniquely. The UK stands for my British labs. I love my British labs. I love what they offer me, both as a part of my family and the high motor in the field. As you're going to find, I have some pretty special dogs. Follow along in our podcast series here as we talk about both in the field hunting and in the field training situations that will hopefully help you progress with your dog at home. As we get going, I want to make sure we give a big thank you to Yukonuba. Uh, I've been on Yukonuba Premium Performance Sport 3020 with my dogs here uh, for probably about the last year and a half, and, and all season this year has been the first full season, and I cannot say enough good things about it. Uh, my dogs, usually at this point of the season, the end of the season, uh, we've been going since September. Now it's end of January. You know, they usually look like, you know, they're skin and bones. They look like they're worn down. Their energy levels just aren't there. It has not been the case, you know, this year. So uh, for you that have sporting dogs out there, highly, highly suggest this. And again, thank you because without them, we couldn't bring to you the information we're bringing. Well, it's, uh, it's getting to be the end of duck season which, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a sad thing, no doubt about it, but man, I, I'd also say that, uh, that I'm ready for it to be done. And I know that kind of sounds strange because this is what I look forward to all year long, but I also think if you've done duck season right at the end of the season, you're like, yeah, I'm ready. You know I mean? It's uh, you can only do so many, you know, late night scouts, so many, you know, three o'clock alarms, you know, so many, um, you know, all day grinds. I mean, we were little, literally, we've been going since some t- September 1st and, uh, you know, I'm ready. I- I'm ready for, uh, for family time. I'm ready, uh, you know, to kind of, you know, get back, recharge the batteries, move into, uh, move into training season. But this is always a fun time of year for me because as I kind of decompress here, you know, this last week, yeah, uh, I really like to reflect on the season and I like to kind of see, uh, you know, where I'm at, uh, dog wise, what surprises there were, what did I really like? What didn't I like? You know, and I tend to be pretty critical, uh, when it comes to this, just because, uh, I have such a high standard of what it is that I'm trying to reach both personally and with my dogs. And, uh, and yeah, I just think being critical is the only way to do that. And so, uh, one thing that I always do is I always ask the people that hunt with me on a consistent basis a few things. And this is what I want to talk about uh, today. I want to talk about a specific dog. And I want to tell you a story, a story that I've never told uh, publicly. And I think it is really unique. And I think um, it'll give some insight to this dog. So uh, as I asked the question this year, uh, one of the questions that I asked was, you know, what dog most impressed you? Now, over the course of the last few years, I, I'm used to a few things. I'm used to Brock, right? Brock being the answer. Now, if you guys don't follow Riverstone Kennels uh, on social media, go do that. Um, that is my kennel, and it'll make sense. You know, as I talk about some of these specific dogs, it'll, it'll make more sense because I, I highlight a lot of the dogs uh, on our social media. But, um, you know, I'm used to hearing about Brock. You know, Brock is the one that, that almost always stands out. Uh, we, we talked a couple episodes ago about his half mile blind retrieve. If you haven't listened to that, go listen to it. It's absolutely incredible. Um, you know, but I'm used to that. I'm used to uh, people saying Bud because of his eyes, because of his focus, because of how uh, under control he is. I'm used to hearing about Clyde because of his intensity and, and his drive. Um, but then, you know, he has that, uh, that teddy bear personality. You know, I'm, I'm usually hearing about a lot of these dogs. And so naturally that's what I expected. You know, when I, when I asked these, these, uh, these questions this year, the response I got back was from my newest dog that I have as far as what most impressed people. And it was strike. And I couldn't agree more. This dog has, uh, has impressed me beyond words this year, which is really, really unique. And I think when people learn the strike story, 
what he was able to accomplish this year becomes even more special. And that's why I want to take the time uh, to tell this story because uh, this is probably the craziest import story that I have. Uh, so uh, for those of you who know me or, or know what I have going on at Riverstone Kennels, you know, I, I breed British Labs. I mean, I have a lot of my dogs, uh, actually all my dogs, come from overseas. Uh, they come with me. Uh, you know, I train with them. I finish them. I get them uh, you know, to where I want them to be. And I decide, you know, is this a dog that I feel like is a part of my breeding program? Or is this dog that I will place with a client as a finished dog? And, um, you know, most of those dogs are going to live more glamorous lives than, you know, than I ever will. And so, um, you know, that's kind of my process. And, and I import a lot of dogs because of it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm always trying to bring these dogs in and trying to find those truly, truly special dogs. And uh, Strike was a unique situation from the get-go for me. And how I even how I even end up with Strike is I had a friend overseas that he was dealing with some health issues, and this gentleman actually ended up passing away. Uh, really, really a sad thing. It's never never fun uh, when you lose a friend. Um, but one of the things that he wanted is he wanted me uh, to have Strike, and so uh, you know I I got Strike. I flew him over. And this was in the middle of January, so this would have been um, this would have been last year, okay? So almost almost exactly a year from now. And when you know when I got strike, I was actually um, I was back home for a short stretch during the the course of uh, of waterfall season, uh, duck season. And you know Minneapolis Airport is where we almost always fly you know these dogs into. It's about an hour away from our house. It's super convenient. They're great. We've gotten to know everybody over there. Super easy airport. And so so I get strike. You know purchase him. He's he's flying over, and I'm in the middle of of kind of my morning, kind of getting things you know uh, going for the day. I have some things I need to do. Uh, you know anytime I'm home, I feel like I'm jamming everything in you know while I'm home because there's just so much to do before I go again on uh, on my next hunt. So I'm in the middle of that kind of chaos, and I get a phone call from the airline saying that uh, strike is on his way, but they're rerouting him to Chicago. And I'm like, <laughs> now, why why is this such an inconvenience? Well, Chicago is about six hours for me versus the hour drive that I was planning on having that day to Minneapolis. And so obviously my day uh, gets a lot more chaotic very quickly. But the reason that they were rerouting him is, is weather. It was just way, way too cold uh, in Minneapolis. And it was. It was super cold that day. So, you know, they reroute him into uh, into Chicago. And I drive uh, six hours down there. And, man, Chicago is just, it's just always a cluster. I've never been through that airport where it hasn't been. Uh, we do periodically have to send dogs uh, through Chicago. And it's just never been smooth. You know, customs is always an issue. Uh, there's always something going on. Uh, you know, where they receive the dogs, it, it just, it's never convenient. And this was no different. So I get down there and, you know, it's like, well, they need this stamp from, from customs. Well, they need this signature. And this whole time they're, they're not releasing strike to, uh, to me. So they're, they're not releasing strike to me. And w the issue that I had with this is that strike had been. <coughs> Excuse me, had a little cough there. So they're not releasing the strike to me. And one of the reasons that I had an issue with this is, you know, poor strike has now been in a crate. For a long, long time, um, you know, I'm, I'm just I'm looking out for him, right? I understand they have their protocols, but they won't even let me take him out and go for a walk, let him use the bathroom until he's cleared. So, anyways, hours go by. I finally get him cleared, and the first thing I do is, you know, I let him out of the crate. You know, of course, with the leash, we walk outside. He goes to the bathroom, and you can tell right off the bat that he's a sweetheart, and. Uh, you know, I always try to put myself in the dog's shoes in this situation, right? So 
these dogs a lot of times have never been in a crate like that before. They've certainly never been on an airplane, let alone for that long. Uh, now they're in a foreign country with people that that speak differently, have a different accent. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you have different um, you have voice infliction. There's a lot going on, right? And so I always try, always try to be super sensitive uh, of that when I bring these dogs over. But you could tell he was just a sweetheart. He wanted to go with you. He wanted to be with you. Uh, just you know, uh, a little softy. And that's kind of how I, I looked at him as this little teddy bear. And uh, so anyways, we're going to drive home. And one, again, crazy cold outside. I don't, I can't remember what it was down there, but it was very cold. Um, and two, he, he's just been in the crate for, you know, tens of hours. I was going to let him ride in the back seat. So uh, I put my seats up uh, in my pickup, my Super Duty. He goes in the back and, uh, and I had a bed for him back there and everything. And he lays down and we drive the whole way back home. And, you know, we're listening to music. You know, I'm talking to him. You know, you can just tell uh, he's a little unsure, but um, but it just seemed very sweet. You know, I'd go down and pet him. He'd lick my hand. Um, you know, everything was off to a good start. So six hours later, I drive into my driveway here uh, here at the kennel. I go down to the house, and the 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 clock on my truck had just turned midnight. Okay, right next to where my clock is is my temperature gauge, and it is negative seventeen degrees outside. So I pull in, probably half asleep, get out, stretch, get my leash, open the back door. You know, their strike is kind of sitting there, and uh, yeah, I'm talking to him. I put the leash on, slip the lead over his head, and I don't know what happened. To this day, I don't know what happened. But when I slipped that lead over his head, his eyes got as wide as they could possibly get, and he absolutely freaked out, like complete panic mode. Like he's like trying to dart by me. He's you know, just, you can tell, is, is 100% panic. So I have him pinned up against the door. He's kind of, he's, you know, when I say fighting, he's not fighting like he's being aggressive. He's just fighting to try to get away from me. Um, and actually, so I have new running boards on my truck because of this incident. Uh, these running boards now uh, retract up into the, uh, into the body of my truck. I had the stock, uh, the stock running boards, which if anyone knows what a Super Duty looks like, they have kind of a gap is probably, I guess, you know, six to eight inches between the body and the actual running board. And, you know, through this struggle, he slips down and his two legs go between the, uh, that gap in my running boards. And he, again, he's rolling, flipping out. And so my first thought goes, oh my gosh, man, you're going to break your legs. And I release the pressure to try to get him out. The worst thing I could have done. Because what happened was when I did that, he rolled over, got out of the lead, and I just saw a black streak run into my woods as fast as he could go and he never looked back i'm calling for him of course now i'm starting to panic but he is gone let me take a second to say at this point i have imported a lot of dogs this is not my first rodeo this this was uh this was not you know an error as far as not knowing how this goes this was an extremely unique situation that to be honest with you, I don't know how it escalated from where it was to where it ended up so quickly. But regardless, now we're here. So I kind of realized, you know, I'm not getting him back sitting here calling. So I walk in the house again. Now it's after midnight. And, uh, you know, Whitney wakes up and, uh, you know, we have our, at the time, one-year-old uh, daughter. Uh, actually, she wouldn't have been quite one. Uh, she's sleeping. And Whit Whit goes, uh, well, where is he? And my response was, I have no idea. And you, know, of course, she doesn't know what's going on. She's like, what? What, what are you talking about? I was like, Whit, I don't know. Like, he panicked. He ran in the woods. I have no idea where he is. So of course, we both go into panic mode. And for the rest of the night, we drive around. We have about a mile by mile square that our property resides on here uh, in western Wisconsin. We just kept driving that square, driving that square, driving that square. Now, I've already been up since, you know, probably 4.30 that morning. Uh, I'm exhausted, but my adrenaline's now going. Well, we, you know, we keep doing laps, and we literally do laps all night. Can't find them. So, uh, fortunately enough, uh, as I'm taking the last lap, 
and I'm going to pull in uh, into uh, our driveway. I turn the corner, and there he is, standing in the middle of the road. So I stop, and I get out, and I'm like, yo, strike, strike. He looks at me and runs as fast as he can the other way down the road. So naturally, I, I drive behind him. I'm not chasing him, right? But I'm trying to just keep him in my sight to see where he goes. And then, boop, back in the woods he goes. So now I make as many phone calls as I can. And I get a bunch of people that we just kind of, we drive around that, that mile by mile square. That first day that he was gone, so you can see where this is going. There's multiple days. But first day, uh, the first day he was gone, we saw him all the time. We, we had multiple situations where you know, we'd get out of the car and we would almost have him and he'd bolt. We had multiple situations that he was you know, out in the middle of, of our cornfield, but the second that he saw anyone, he would bolt. He was in pure panic and survival mode. So we go uh, all day, uh, don't, don't get him. And now we have to go again, it's cold. Right, it was negative seventeen. I don't think it was quite that cold the next day, but it was very, very cold. Um, second day goes by, and uh, nobody sees him. After having probably ten or twelve encounters, you know, that first day of being so close, um, nobody sees him. And 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 I will say that looking back on it, it was hard to appreciate at the time. But looking back on it, I'm incredibly thankful for the network of people that I had here. I had three sheriff deputies all uh, all here helping me uh, try to track him down. Uh, two of them were on duty, one of them off. Um, you know, that goes through the relationship that I have here with, uh, with our law enforcement. I'm cr- uh, incredibly grateful for them and try to do everything I can for them. Um, I had probably another 12 to 15 people uh, client-wise that had all, um, you know, I was able to, to network close to and where all took, all took their day. Obviously I'm not, I can't pay him anything like that, but took their day to help me try to catch this dog. Right. Well, the next day was no different. It was just that we were completely un, unsuccessful. And so after day two, again, no encounters, no sightings, no anything. Uh, Whitney and I come back, we kind of start trying to, we start trying to just uh, accept the fact that he's probably no longer with us. Yeah. Um, obviously very cold, you know, there's a number of things that can happen, but he's not prepared for that kind of cold, right? He's not, uh, and we don't know where he is, right? He could be 10 miles from here by now, uh, but he's got no collar on. Uh, he, he certainly won't come to anyone. Uh, it, there's just too many things against him at this point that we start trying to come to grasp with that. Well, that night, uh, Whitney and I stayed up and we we're making the signs, you know, um, trying to be as proactive as we can. And, you know, we had, you know, we had some people that were kind of on, on social media trying to you know, spread the word, everything like that. Uh, but yeah, no sightings is just, it's hard to get excited. So day three comes and, uh, we are out, Whitney and I are putting out signs and, uh, Whitney calls me as I'm putting one of the signs up and she goes, Josh, he's in the road in front of me. And I don't know why, but my first thought was like somebody hit him and he's laying there in the road. Um, but I'm like, is he okay? And she's like, he looks he looks great, but he's standing in the road in front of me, and, he, and she's on this little back road. And I'm like, okay, well, just try to keep him in your side. And of course, as soon as I say that, she goes, okay, now he's running. He's running down the road. So I, you know, I zip down there as fast as I can, and she, uh, Whitney saw. Uh, Whitney is my wife, for those of you who don't know. Uh, Whitney saw him go into this little block of woods, about a 40-acre block, but it's open on all sides. Uh, on, there's one road, one major road that I was nervous about, so I make all my phone calls, get a bunch of people there, and I'm around this 40-acre chunk, we had probably, we probably had 15, if not 20 vehicles that were surrounding this thing. I called two buddies with snowmobiles. And I'm like, we're going to, we're going to run him down. Like we're going to get him out in one of these fields. He cannot run the snowmobiles. We're going to run him down. Um, and when I say run him down, I don't mean hit him. You know, of course, I mean like finally be able to, to get my hands on him kind of thing. So uh, the snowmobiles are just about there. Obviously it takes time uh, to get there, just about there. And I get a phone call that uh, from one of the, the people watching the busy road saying he just crossed the road. 
and he's going uh, he's going towards the airport. We have a little regional airport. So I fly over there and I'm trying to, of course, everyone's calling me. I'm trying to communicate with everybody all at the same time. Um, I get to the south end of the airport and I'm trying to find him, trying to find him. I got my binoculars. I'm looking all of a sudden on the north end, the far north end, I see a little black dot running across this field. So being the genius I am, I, uh, I hammer it down the runway trying to go catch up uh, to strike. Meanwhile, I am looking up. I'm trying to figure out if there's planes coming. Um, I'm on the phone with Whitney. I'm saying, hey, here's where he is. Here's where I'm going. And just as I'm saying that, I look over to the airport office, and there's a yellow jacket coming to me, and he doesn't look real happy. (laughs) And uh, I tell Whitney, I said, Whit, I'm I'm probably going to jail. I have no idea. This can't be legal. Uh, So here's where he is. I'll do it. I'll do the best I can. And uh, so anyway, as I come up again, he doesn't look you know, real happy. I rolled on the window and and I say, sir, I'm so sorry. I'm trying to catch this dog that's right there. Um, I was you know, very apologetic. And this is where the small town thing really comes in. Immediately, he changed you know, his facial expression. He's like, man, like I'll, I'll help you catch him. Yeah, for sure. And he's like super enthusiastic, um, super, super nice. To the point, here's how nice he was, to the point that he held planes because what Strike did, Strike actually went and he, he laid down. He's exhausted, right? Three days of running, he's exhausted. He lays down in the middle of this cornfield, right in the middle of the airport, lays down, and is just, you can tell he's just kind of spent. So, you know, this gentleman super super kind holds all airplanes from coming in because he doesn't want to uh scare strike off he holds planes from leaving or even going towards the runway because he doesn't want to scare you know strike that that is super super cool um but anyway so we get there i've got now tons of people i have one of the sheriff deputies go to my house and get my musky net so f- for those of you who don't know musky are, are a big fish it's it's kind of my summer thing that i love to do uh so i have a very large net and I told him right where I was. I'm trying to organize everything. And uh, we just had so many people trying to help that it kind of started to feel like things were getting a little out of control. Like all of a sudden I've got, you know, people with vehicles that are, are like people are getting in vehicles saying they're going to go around the other way. Uh, some people are like, well, I, I think I, I can walk over here and block this off. And I, I think I was just to the point that I was so done with going through this that it just like it kind of like got to a point i snapped a little and and you'll have to excuse me here but this is it just came out i was like will everybody just shut the fuck up and listen because i'm done chasing this dog and it was like you could have heard a pin drop all of a sudden it was like oh shoot like okay and so i just organized everybody said here's the deal the fence there's a fence that runs on the north side of of this property So we're going to take two snowmobiles. We're going to push him towards that fence. So he's got nowhere to go just in case this where nobody's going anywhere until this net gets here. I'm going to ride on the back. We're going to get him in between us and I'm going to catch this dog. Okay. So net comes, we're on two snowmobiles and I wish in the worst way I had a video of this because this was like the most redneck thing that you have ever seen for a Northern boy, which is riding on the back of a snowmobile with the musky net trying to catch a dog. I mean it was <laughs> it was it was really comical looking back on it. It wasn't funny at the time. So that's what we do. We got to the point we just kind of eased up and kept him as calm as we could until there was a point he jumped up, started running, and then it was game on. And it was go at you know, go obviously we wanted the big thing was trying to keep him safe, right? So keep him, you know, keep him between us, but don't like squeeze him to where he's gonna hit one of the sleds. Um so we get close to him, and the the first the first swing that I have at him, uh, him being him, I get him in the net, and he does this like spin jump thing and gets out of it. And so the the net hits the ground, the end of the net goes in my chest and lifts me up off the off the snowmobile. Somehow I hold on, and I'm probably uh, my buddy Kyle was driving. Um, I'm probably choking Kyle out because I'm trying to hold on to him. <laughs> he he's trying to steer. We zip around, take another run at him, get close. I get the net on him. I jump on the net, and it was like every muscle in my body immediately relaxed from three days 
of being so incredibly stressed out that I couldn't take it. He, I think pretty naturally, um, just ends up just, you know, going to the bathroom everywhere. I'm sure he too was very exhausted. I'm sure he's scared to death. He has no idea what's going on. And, uh, it was, it was, it was, it was unbelievable because, uh, after yeah, I kind of let him calm down, uh, we put, we put two leashes on him. Uh, we put, uh, I think three collars, like we were doing everything. Like you are not getting out of this again. Um, I lifted him up. I carried him back. And again, we probably have 20 people on the tarmac now of this, uh, this airport that were all trying to help us. And it was, it was about the most, uh, emotionally homecoming thing that I've ever seen. The, here are all these people that don't know this dog from boo that feel like they're a part of this dog. They just spent the last selfishly or selflessly, sorry, selflessly spent the last three days of their life making sure that this dog was going to come home safe and sound. Pretty cool. So anyways, get to, uh, get to the vet to kind of wrap up the strike in poor story, get to the vet. Uh, the vet tells me, um, <laughs> the first thing that I thought was comical, because of course this happened on a Sunday, uh, they're like, well, there is going to be an emergency charge. My response was, I don't care what you charge me. <laughs> we just need to make sure at this point this dog is is okay. So we get uh, we get in the room. They take him back. Whitney and I are in the room, and I'm going, oh, my gosh. Like, you know, he, he looks okay, but like, he can't be. They come back probably 15 minutes later, and uh, – the vet goes, who yeah, I know very well, um, he goes, no, Josh, he's great. <laughs> and, and I laughed. I said, there's no way. It's just not possible. And he's like, well, he's like, I don't know the story, uh, but he's great. Uh, maybe a little dehydrated. So, you know, we're giving him an IV to get his fluids back up. Otherwise, he's, he's fantastic. Not a, not a scratch on him. <laughs> so, so we take strike home. Now, now all of a sudden is a completely different mindset, right? So now we have him, he's here, but there's no way I can trust him. Like I can't let him outside to go to the bathroom. I can't let him outside to run around. I can't let him outside to do anything. The other thing was when I originally imported him, my thought was, is that he was going to go be uh, one of my clients, uh, gun dogs is basically what it was. Because from what I was told is that, you know, he had a pretty decent motor, but maybe not the highest end motor, right? Um, he, he still had, you know, quite a bit of work to finish up on his training. There were things like that. And I thought, well, maybe I'll just, you know, I'll finish some of his training or all of it, depending on, uh, you know, where, what client I thought was the best fit. And then, you know, place him in a forever home. Well, now I can't even do that, right? Because there's no way that I can give a dog to someone that I can't trust that they can't let him outside. So a lot of things are spinning through my head. Well, for about the next eight months, we walked strike outside with two leads on. We had one that was a, a snap lead to a collar that he kept on, which of course had our info on it. And then we also had a slip lead on. And we'd walk him outside, you know, three, four times a day with two leads, uh, leashes on every single day for eight months. That was taxing. Right. So then all of a sudden we get to the point that probably about a month in, you could tell he was really starting to trust us. He was starting to feel part of the family. Uh, Ava, who's her daughter, who is now, you know, uh, just about one at the time. Uh, he's cuddling with her on the on the floor. You know, and of course, at that point with her, I was pretty uh, standoffish about those two being together because I didn't, you know, as much as Strike didn't trust me, I didn't know if I trusted him. Right. We're still trying to learn each other. But. You could tell you could tell how sweet it was. You could tell he had that personality. So time goes on, uh, and I start doing uh, probably you know mid spring. I start doing you know just some some little fun retrieves with him in the yard with a check cord on. Okay, so I've, and I I think I even had no I think I just had one. I was gonna say I thought I had two check cords, but I don't think I did. So I just had a check cord that you know I'd give him a. 10 yard retrieve and reel him in, you know, just little stuff to kind of keep him engaged. You could tell he had a very soft mouth. You could tell he enjoyed working, but you couldn't tell how much, right? Because again, he's on a lead. Um, and I want to say at this point, strike is probably 
a year and a half old. I don't know if I've said that yet. You know, a year and a half, maybe you know, going towards two, somewhere in there. And you, know, you just don't know a dog that age being back in a check cord. You know, you're not going to see everything. So, uh, you know, in the meantime, of course, I'm going through my normal training season. We get into the summer, um, and I just felt like I had to give him a shot. So I brought him up, and I brought him out with uh, with all all the big dogs, uh, this all of our advanced dogs, which are our personal dogs, and then all the advanced dogs that are going through training, uh, you know, both personally and client wise at the kennel. And uh, Whitney would bring him up, and she would just sit there with him. And they would watch, you know, retrieves, just watch us do blinds. And Strike would just sit there uh, on leash, but sit there all day or all afternoon uh, and just watch. Just watch dogs retrieve, watch dogs retrieve. Well, at some point, it's like, okay, we got to give him a chance, right? And uh, so, you know, I held my breath the whole time, but, you know, take that lead off of him and start throwing him some short marks. Well, you can see every retrieve is kind of coming out of his shell more and more. Then all of a sudden we we uh, you know throw a duck for him. Well, that pumps him up even more. Then we throw a flyer for him. That pumps him up even more. And then it's like you start really seeing some power out of this dog. I'm going okay. Well, maybe we've got something to work with here. Not to the point that I'm like, hey, I'm going to go place him with somebody, but maybe I've got something to work with. So we go through. Now it's probably uh, into this last September. And I take him on my first, or on his first, rather, his first off-site training because he's doing really well. He's, you know, he's he's actually picked up things incredibly fast. He's starting his lining work. Um, he's doing his whistle sits. He's he's starting some three-way casting. Um, all all in about a month, you know, span. And uh, so, anyways, I take him off-site, which was nerve-wracking for me because this is the first time he's ever been off-leash now on a property other than mine. And that day is when I knew I, I had a dog. Because as nervous as I was, I watched a difference in him. I watched him come out, out of his shell. Not only out of his shell, but his confidence. Like He almost like bowed his chest up and was like, all right, I got this. He was running. You know, I think that day we were doing you know, probably 200-yard marks, and he was stepping on every one of them. I did you know, with, uh, with my you know, senior and season-level dogs. I had some blinds set up. And I mean, he was lining them and he he, like, everything was like, we went from, you know, probably a five on the scale to an eight, like in a day. And it was, it was a crazy jump. And I was like, oh my gosh. I remember coming home telling Whitney, like, you're never going to guess like strikes, like crushing this thing. So from that point forward, we went from, you know, from like crawling into walking to running really fast. You know, if we kind of look at that crawl, walk, run is kind of how we go through our progressions of training. We all of a sudden were sprinting and we're like, all right, we've got something. So uh, I go through the next couple months of, uh, of, you know, continue to work with him. Um, and I was doing little things like he would go everywhere with me if I went to, you know, if I went into town for gas or uh, went, you know, to a restaurant, went, like he just drove everywhere with me because I wanted him to understand that getting in the vehicle is a good thing. Um, you know, going you know, with me is a good thing. Like trying to have all these positive associations. This is a ton of work, right? But all of it, all of it's great. So then uh, we get into my, I really didn't have a goal originally of, of hunting him this year, but he was doing so well. I was like, well, Maybe I'll take him on uh, on my first Arkansas trip and just see because I knew that uh, I had our big blind down there that I could get him in a couple of days beforehand and do training sessions out of there to familiarize him with where he's going to be hunting out of the routine, right? As far as you know, getting in the side by side, driving out there, getting in the box, doing retrieves up and down the ramp. But the reason I wanted to do that before the live hunt is I didn't want him to experience all that chaos you know, at, in the dark, really. Um, I felt that there was too much there that could really set him off. And then if for some reason he did bold, which is something I was always nervous of, then I can't see him. I don't have any idea what's going on. Right. So I did all of it. I did probably three days in a row of training and he was, he was crushing it. I mean, he was going, he was going through decoys. I went as far as setting decoys out and doing everything as far as what a live hunt would look like. And he was doing great. And, uh, so we get out, uh, the, the first day that would be his hunt, uh, his first hunt. And I remember being probably as nervous as I've ever been going and hunting a dog because, uh, as confident as I was with him, 
Um, I was also that unsure as far as what, what was actually going to go on. So I get him out there. I put him in, you know, the box, and now he's been training out of for the last three days. Uh, I, you know, I set the decoys. I, I get him, you know, I get in there, and uh, we just had teal everywhere. And so what was great about it is that because he had already trained out of that box, he knew, okay, I, if I look out the front, you know, that's usually where the retrieve comes. But the best part was that we weren't in that blind for two minutes, and birds started going and sitting on the on uh, on the water in front of us which was great because it got his attention, right? So shooting uh, light comes and, uh, you know, we, we let out a first group and I think we, we killed maybe four or five out of that group. Um, he's on the left side of the blind with me. Most of those birds fell on the right side because those birds came in left to right. Uh, but there was one bird that kind of peeled and turned off and, and I didn't shoot because I'm focused on him. I want to see if something goes on, I want to see it, Right. But of course I hear with that one last shot and I look up and there's one bird going kind of off to the left here. This sails way back. So we're in the woods. So there's a hole way back into the woods. Well, I look down at him and what bird do you think he saw? And I know that this, this bird is crippled. I know this bird is moving, but I don't have an option. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to call him off the bird that you know, he sees, you know, and uh, you know, it's not that far into the woods. I don't think strike. And he looks like Superman coming off that that stand, just you know, big water entry, you know, confident swimming out there. Well, I'm watching him, and uh, and I'm smiling because I'm like, oh, you know, he yeah, like, he gets it, right? This is he's having fun. And I look up, and I see that bird swimming as fast as that bird can swim, and it is way further in the woods than I thought. Now I thought about calling him off that bird, <laughs> but it's one of those things that everything is going right. I didn't want to potentially throw a, a risk into it where if I whistle him, you know, what if he, what if he's so focused, he doesn't want to stop. Right. So then I make, I make a correction. Does that make him want to shut down? Does that make him all of a sudden not like honey? All, all this stuff is going through my mind. And I just felt like the best thing to do is let him roll and let's see what happens. So he goes, uh, he crosses, uh, crosses the hole, which is probably about 40 yards. He goes into the woods. And he immediately catches scent. Like he is, he is on where this bird is and he's, and he's gone. Can't see him. How nervous do you think I am right now? And I'm sitting there sweating bullets, trying to think of every, I mean, in my head, I'm going, where is he potentially going to pop out and how fast can I get there? And so I'm sitting there and I'm looking and now, uh, Steve Snell, uh, who is the owner of Gundog Supply, which let's give a, a shout out to, uh, to Gundog Supply, sponsor of, uh, of our show here. Um, you know, if you guys need any training equipment at all, they're certainly the place to go. Um, and probably a, a bigger thing for me is they're great people. Rob and Steve are some of the, of my favorite people, uh, in this industry. And, uh, and I would highly, highly suggest going to gundogsupply.com for any, any of your, uh, your training needs. But anyway, so Steve, who's the owner of Gundog Supply, is sitting literally right next to me. And Steve's a, he, he's a, he's a dog guy, right? He's a good dog guy. He gets it. He had heard this story the night before. Strike's gone for about, mm, out of sight for about 15 seconds, which felt like 15 minutes. And I, I just hear Steve go, hey, Josh. I'm like, yeah. He's like, how nervous are you right now? <laughs> it was like the worst thing he could have said. He knew he was he was jabbing at me. I was like, uh, pretty nervous. He's like, yeah, yeah, I would be too. About fifteen more seconds go by, and and uh, and all and I can feel I can feel him. I'm sure he can feel me. As far as we're tension is kind of starting to get there a little bit. Uh, probably another fifteen seconds go by or so, and now I'm going. Okay, I got to get out. Right. So I'm, I'm just going to go towards the back of the blind and, uh, you know, we have a door in the back. I was going to hop out and try to get going. Um, and the reason that, that I was going to get out there instead of just, you know, starting to whistle and start to call is because I can't see him. Right. So if he's responding to the whistle, he's doing things right. I can't even see if he is doing it. So I was just going to physically go out there. I just get to the back of the door and, uh, and Steve goes, Josh, Josh. I turn, he's like, look at this. I look out the front of the blind. Here's strike coming back with that teal. I've had a lot of proud moments in the field. That one is up there. 
that that moment right there was one that I one I never thought I'd ever have, let alone have this quickly. But then to watch him come out and do his thing and, and step up to the plate, there were so many emotions going through my head that I, I, I can't even really describe it. But it was one of those moments that you have over the course of a season that you'll never forget. He came back with that bird. I you know, I was his biggest cheerleader the whole way back. He gets back. What does he do? Turns right back around and looks out to the spread and goes, all right, I got the next mark. Strike. Toosh. Goes and he picks up, uh, I think it was another another four. Goes and picks up the other four. Boom, boom, boom. And, I, and I'm looking and Steve goes, man, like, I've seen a lot of things, but that is a special one. And I'm going, yeah. And so Rob, who is Steve's brother, uh, who is also uh, you know owner of GundogSupply.com, He's on the outside of the blind. He does all of our, all of our photography. So, again, if you go to Riverstone Kennels uh, on social, Instagram, Facebook, you see all of our fantastic, phenomenal photos. Uh, we have a lot of people that, that do those for us, but Rob travels the whole season with us taking these photos. And uh, so I hear Rob from the outside, and Rob has seen a lot of dogs over his time. And Rob goes, Josh, there is no way that it's this dog's first hunt. And I just went, like, man... <laughs> Like you heard the story, he's like, no, he's like, I know it is, but there's no way. And I'm like, it's just one of those times that that you realize you have something more special than what you ever realized. And at that point, that's what I was going through. I realized at that moment that I had something special here. And what I'm so thankful for is that looking back to the all the chaos and everything that happened back with him when he took off on me. I wouldn't have been in that moment with him that hunting season if it wasn't for that. Again, in my head, he you know he wasn't the the caliber of dog that I thought that I was wanting, and so I was going to finish his training and uh, you know and sell him to one of our clients. I never would have got to this opportunity. And I've always believed I've always believed that things happen in your life for a reason. Yeah, I think God works in mysterious ways that you know, you can't like that was a lot of pain that I went through during those three days he was gone. And the next, you know, basically year of getting him back up to speed and up to where, but, but this is why strike is now going to, he's a a big part of my family today. He is, he is probably my daughter's biggest love bug, um, goes most places with me, but this hunting season, he was the dog that, that ended up standing out. And it's just really kind of surreal to me uh, that we came to that point. And, uh, you know, so uh, before I keep going here, I want to give a shout out to Sitka. Uh, Sitka is a a great sponsor of this show here. Uh, Specifically, I want to talk about the waiters. Those waiters, man, like I spent probably 80 days in those waiters, you know, this last year. You got to check out the waiters. They are phenomenal, second to none. Love it. Uh, You go to www.sitkagear.com. And go check those out. I promise you they're the most comfortable waiters you will ever, ever put on. Um, but, uh, you know, the, these dogs, man, they, they just have this way of, of connecting us, right? And so Strike, I, I think Strike has us feeling um, like you always have to look one step further. Right, so Rob and I actually talked about this later on in uh, in the season because we went out then from there forward. I mean, there wasn't a hunt that went on that we could say Strike didn't crush it. Like, not only did he not do well, like he crushed it. He was great with his blinds. He handled them very, very well. His marking was superb. His game finding ability was you know second to none. I mean, there was like go down the checklist. I mean, he crushed the season. But when it comes down to it, I think you know one of the things that again what Rob and I were talking about was how special is it that dogs in the situation that they go through, if you kind of step back and look at it, how it can make you reflect on really on your own life. I wasn't even going to give Strike that chance, and he went out and he proved me wrong. You know, I th- I really think this story is incredibly unique for a few reasons. 
one, I've never had anything like that go on ever. You know, most of the time there's a little bit of a transition, you know, from dogs that, you know, overseas that we kind of just ease them into your know, life around us and life, you know, here. This was a completely different level. This took a major commitment on both my part, but my wife's part. Whitney was a huge part of this. This this was a, a major commitment, I'd say, on my hunting parties group. We went into the, to that day with, you know, both Steve and Rob, you know, were with me, um, and actually, I believe uh, Tim from uh, from Lucky Duck was also with us too. And so Lucky Duck is uh, is you know the final sponsor of our show here. Uh, if you guys have not checked out the Lucky Duck crate, you have to do it. Your dogs will be safer riding in that crate. That's a five star crash rated uh, crate. You they will be safer. And come on, we got to keep our, our dogs safe. So check out that Lucky Duck crate. Um, but I, I believe it was actually the the three of us, and we went into that knowing that this hunt might be a cluster. We went in knowing that this hunt is about strike. This isn't about us. This isn't about pulling the trigger. And I think what I what happened is through strike, I took a step back and I appreciated the network of people that I have more as a result. You start figuring out who your friends are really, really fast. When they drop everything to come help you in a situation like I went through. You find out who your hunting partners are really, really fast when all of them can say, hey, today's supposed to be a great hunt, but this is going to be about him, not about me. And I think that I've come to appreciate the people that are in my life more as a result of strike. You don't realize how blessed you are until you kind of step back and you look at that. And so I think Strike has taught me a lot of things already. I can't wait for the rest of our hunting career together. But I'm already thankful for the things that that, uh, that he has opened my eyes to. Some pretty special stuff. So as you guys go through and you finish your seasons, as you head into, uh, into your training seasons, you know, take a step back. Look at the people that are around you. Look at the people that have helped you, you know, get there and, and be thankful for the network of people that these dogs provide for us. So my best friends have come as a result of, uh, of networking with these dogs. And it's a pretty special thing. And it's one that I certainly will never take for granted again. So uh, appreciate you guys sticking with me here. Appreciate you guys listening to a little lengthier story. Um, but keep up with Strike. I think you're going to see a lot of fireworks come out of this little dog here uh, in the, the years to come. And I am stoked to head into training season feeling like I, I don't have to worry about training wheels. I don't have to worry about any aids. We're going to go crush this season, uh, this training season, then move into uh, next hunting season. So make sure you keep up, make sure you follow along. And uh, thank you for spending this time with me. Thanks for listening. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Leave us a review on iTunes and a special thank you to Yukonuba because without them, we couldn't do what we do here, bringing this information to you.